Jonathan. Self-sufficiency is a recurring theme in development cooperation analytics. Would you recommend for governments of poor countries to set legal environments enabling higher levels of self-sufficiency? Uh, in in general, no. I think I mean I think we we should better see uh, degrees of self-sufficiency as an outcome rather than a, a target. I think that there are. Uh, there's a lot that can be done to improve the productivity and the sustainability of agriculture in a way that would lead to increased production and in many cases increased ratios of self-sufficiency. But if we focus on self-sufficiency as a target, then there's a risk of implementing a whole panoply of instruments that we know have been, uh, have, have been shown to be ineffective in the long term. So uh, self-sufficiency, we, we don't think that that's necessarily a, a bad idea itself, but we think it should be a result of the right kinds of policies, not something that should be mandated with a whole load of rigidities introduced in order to enforce it. It would probably mean focusing on a number of staples uh, and, and that won't work anyway, isn't it? Well, no, I think that um, there, there are large opportunities to improve the productivity of smallholder farmers and farmers of a range of different, different sizes. And that would lead to increases in their production and would enable them to, to sell their products on markets. Focusing on a target of self-sufficiency seems to presume either that these farmers uh, are not competitive or they're not even potentially competitive with the right kinds of investments. And we don't think that's necessarily the case. Emerging economies seem to have passed through a stage where they basically taxed uh, before. They taxed heavily the agriculture and then when they really emerged they, they've been doing what the rich countries been doing. They, they actually subsidized them. Does that actually mean Don't fiddle with the small policies, with the little staple food there, and this basically shift and subsidize your your agriculture. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't draw that lesson. No, I, I think if you look at the poorest countries, in many cases they do still have a tendency to suppress prices to the benefit of urban urban consumers. So, uh, even coming back to that earlier question about self sufficiency, often what we're not doing is providing pre producers with a higher price. We're actually suppressing their incentives. And the main priority for those farmers is to actually let them respond to market signals in a way that they've not hitherto the two been able to do. What's happening, I think, in the larger emerging economies is that we're seeing a big adjustment in the agricultural sector with labor transitioning from agriculture to other, other sectors. And in a way, some fairly blunt levers are being used as a way to kind of manage that, that process. Now, we would say that there are better instruments to, to do that, that really we should be trying to facilitate that adjustment process rather than simply put a, put a break on it. But it's true that uh, the larger emerging economies are, in a sense, rich enough to be able to afford to repeat some of the kinds of mistakes that, that, that richer OECD countries made in decades past. Is it maybe because laborers are also voters and when they move from the rural country into the towns, they, they get more weight? Um, well, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the process of supporting agriculture as countries get richer is fundamentally related to, to politics. Uh, what happens is consumers become, in a sense, richer they can afford to pay more for their, for their food and they're less aware of the extent to which they're implicitly being taxed. Whereas a narrowing band of, of producers have a greater interest in trying to lobby for and obtain support. So we think it's, uh, this development is something that is essentially a political kind of response. It's one that we saw in OECD countries and we're also seeing to a considerable extent in emerging economies too. No, you're an analyst and you like your tools and instruments. And I think one of the things, you know, analysis means breaking things down. It's Platon, whatever, 3,000 years. But do you think that we maybe have the wrong dichotomy, that we still stuck to the rural-urban divide even though the world has changed a bit? Is it maybe the fault a little bit of the, of the analytical people that, that are afraid that they don't have the tools in the future if you, if you, if you pass that? Well, that's a big, a big question. I think that uh, if we're looking for a way of breaking things down, I think the distinction between uh, rural and urban economies is, is a useful one. But so too is the distinction between farm and non-farm. And what we see is uh, 
changes in the degree of urbanisation, both as people migrate from rural areas to urban areas, but also as rural areas themselves become that, that bit more urban. Now within that, what we see, in particular in the rural economy, is a diversification of activities. So agriculture itself, as an independent activity, becomes progressively less important in these rural economies. It's not to say it's not important, it's, it's, in a sense it's, the, it's the, the kind of germination of a lot of value added that can be created on top of agriculture in rural areas. And I think it's more that kind of paradigm we need to understand some of these development challenges. Okay, there's always a lot of talk about paradigm shifts. You, you spoke about farm, non-farm. Farm, farm, non -farm yeah. yeah. How about the value chains? Is there new analytical instruments that, that uh, will look into breaking that into maybe 10 little subdivisions on, along the value chains and food chains? Well, I think, I think there's a, a lot of, of micro field level work that is being done to see what specific opportunities, opportunities exist. Uh, at a broader aggregate level, we know uh, the benefits of uh, value added creation and also it gives us a lot of insights into, into the role that trade plays. Often we really understand, underestimate the importance of trade because we fail to account for the importance of value chains. We think, oh, what we're doing is we're protecting a, a particular sector, but often many times what we're doing is we're also imposing a tax on that sector because it's, it's forced to pay, for example, higher prices for inputs. So the whole impacts of trade and the, the, the links between trade and development are certainly uh, made more complex by these intricate value chains that, e that exist across sectors. In general, agricultural value chains are not so complex, but increasing complexity is something that we're seeing. Thank you very much. Thank you.